Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can offer tips on how to handle criticism, how to cope with criticism. I've also seen requests on how to ignore insults and how to separate insults from criticism. And a few times I've even heard questions that ask, are there ways to ignore criticism or to ignore negative criticism altogether. So what we see on the internet in terms of dealing with criticism is some portion of good advice, but also a lot of awful advice. For example, if we look at the area of narcissism, we see this idea that anyone who criticizes anyone else must be a narcissist. And if somebody's a narcissist, we should learn to ignore them, which of course is not good advice because that's actually narcissistic in itself. So I'll be talking here in this video about this construct, the what I call unlocking your inner narcissist construct. We see this advice offered by the life coaches and other people on the internet, but I'll also talk about kind of my system, which I think is a better way, at least I think it's a more logical way to handle criticism. So first this kind of starts with the idea of adaptive narcissism. And this gets a little controversial because some people, of course, believe that narcissism doesn't have any adaptive components. But actually, it does seem to. They're not adaptive in every situation, but in some situations, certain narcissistic characteristics can actually be useful. Now, when we talk about adaptive narcissism, we're almost always talking about grandiose narcissism rather than vulnerable narcissism. Although with vulnerable narcissism, there are a few characteristics they can be adaptive, like distrust and pessimism can be helpful under certain circumstances. But again, usually we're talking about the grandiose features. So the characteristics of grandiose narcissism that may be adaptive in certain situations would include a high level of extroversion, so having positive emotions and being optimistic, a low level of neuroticism, so being stable and calm under pressure, social dominance, also called social boldness, and self-confidence, are usually considered positive under certain situations. A key component for this video will be the next characteristic, which is being resistant to criticism. So that's certainly adaptive under certain circumstances. And being callous and unemotional can be helpful under certain circumstances. Now, what's maladaptive about grandiose narcissism? Well, pretty much everything else, right? Being arrogant, being condescending, a sense of entitlement, fantasies of power and wealth, superficial charm, being manipulative, angry, aggressive, and envious. All those are characteristics of grandiose narcissism that don't really seem to have an adaptive component under really almost any circumstances. Maybe there's a few circumstances, but they're generally considered fairly negative. So in considering the adaptive elements of narcissism, moving back to those, this really comes to this question of, is there a way to unlock your inner narcissist? And I think the question that needs to come before that would be, is it a good idea to? Do you want to unlock your inner narcissist? But moving back to the kind of can you question, is it possible to adopt a characteristic or a trait you don't have? For example, if you needed to be callous or emotional at a certain time, could you do that? A lot of times we look at that as a trait, so it's something you have or you don't have. But what about the being resistant to criticism piece? Is this a trait, a skill, or both? So, do you want to unlock it, and can you unlock it? Well, this resistance to criticism is really a refusal to entertain any type of criticism. It's not an advanced skill, it's not thoughtful, it's not a high-level skill. It's actually more of an immature and self-deceiving skill. It goes hand-in-hand -hand with narcissism. So, this idea that you kind of separate out the resistance to criticism piece without taking on the other characteristics of narcissism, to me that's a little bit controversial. I'm not sure that's actually possible. When we think about how the grandiose narcissist can be resistant to criticism, they believe everyone is less important than them. So they disregard the opinions of others. And that's fairly easy if you believe people are less important. They can also select positive statements that are made about them and internalize them, unless they're not positive enough, which of course they still get deflected. But either way, they seem to have an ability that's tied in with narcissism as a whole that allows them to have this ability to be resistant to criticism. 
It's not just a feature of narcissism, it's really integrated into narcissism. So in the narcissistic way of thinking, only the narcissist matters. So only their thoughts and beliefs matter. So in order to be resistant to criticism in the way that a narcissist is resistant, you kind of have to take on that attitude. And again, I don't think that's necessarily healthy. The resistance to criticism in the way the narcissist use it, they throw out everything. They throw out the helpful, the constructive, the fair, along with the hurtful, the rude, and the inaccurate. So all the criticism just gets dumped together. They can deflect all of it. So is this type of resistance to criticism protective? Sure. Yes, it is. It actually offers a great deal of protection to the fragile self-esteem that the narcissist has. But does it help them to grow as a person? And would it help somebody else to grow as a person if they used it? No. There's really no evidence available that says that it's a good idea to throw out constructive criticism along with hurtful criticism, and somehow this will let you grow and develop as a person. So I think it's protective, but not ultimately helpful. So this reminds me of a story from a long time ago when I was in grade school. When I think of like the protective nature of narcissism and kind of the pros and cons of it, it reminds me of the story. I remember years ago being at recess, right? So this is a period of time in school when you go out and play and everything. And I think it was around fifth grade or sixth grade or something like this. And there was a bully on the playground and one of my friends on the playground. And they were kind of in an altercation, although, of course, it was the bully who was initiating the altercation. And my friend was a victim. Now, he had studied for just a few months this particular martial art called judo, which was very popular at the time. And I think it was mostly done for, like, good exercise and to keep him busy. But he seemed to be a good student of it. And he only really learned one technique. It was a throw that he'd learned, kind of a throwing technique where somebody would throw a punch and you could kind of flip them over onto the ground. Well, the bully was kind of throwing punches at him. It wasn't like a serious fight. It wasn't like a fight to the death or anything. It was just two fifth or sixth graders fighting, but it was bullying. So the bully was throwing these different punches. So I guess my friend got this idea that he should grab one of these punches and try to flip the bully over. And that's what he did. The bully threw a punch, and my friend grabbed his wrist and kind of twisted and flipped him right over and onto the ground. And it was dirt. It was, wasn't pavement or anything, but it hurt him. I mean, it was, it was painful. And my friend really wasn't narcissistic in any way at all that I remember. He was actually amazed that the technique worked. So both the bully and my friend were really surprised by this. The bully was laying on the ground, surprised, and my friend was sitting there like, I can't believe this worked. I can't believe that that throw actually worked. I guess he figured it was worth a shot and he would try it out, but he didn't really think it would really flip the guy over. Now, of course, they both got in trouble because it was a fight. They both got carted off to the principal's office, and I don't know whatever happened. I don't think it was too severe in terms of punishment or anything. But I remember as they were walking him off, as the teachers were walking him off, he was still saying, I just can't believe that worked. And the reason I connect this to the narcissism piece is because, really, that fifth or sixth grader, my classmate there, had more insight than a narcissist. He was amazed by the protective ability of this throw they learned. He learned to deflect physical force and he was amazed by it. The narcissist uses the technique, right, the deflection of criticism technique, but they don't really have a respect for it. They don't understand how powerful it is. They just know that it works for them. They don't have the insight that my classmate had in that situation. He was amazed by the effectiveness. A narcissist isn't. They use the technique all the time. It works exceedingly well, but they don't have, again, an appreciation for it. So what I'm really saying here is unlocking your inner narcissist certainly comes with benefits. In a sense, it's safer, and maybe the lack of insight component is actually one of the safer components of it, but it's not better. For example, it generally doesn't work out for the narcissist. It may work temporarily for somebody who's not narcissistic or for somebody who is, but I don't think it's a better option in the long run. Now, I have heard this argument that sometimes it is better to ignore all criticism and just to kind of adopt a narcissistic stance temporarily. But again, in the long run, I don't think that unlocking the inner narcissist is really a good idea. So if it isn't a good idea, then is there another way to cope with criticism? If we're not going to deflect all criticism, 
then how can we handle criticism? And that's what I'll talk about next. So in terms of my ideas about handling criticism, I like to view the nature of the criticism as a key component of coping with it. And I use this acronym for my system, BASIC, B-A-S-I-C. So it has really five components to it. So again, I'm talking about the nature of the criticism. That's the important part here with this BASIC model. So the first letter in the acronym B is for bias. So you want to consider the bias behind the criticism that's directed toward you. And the important question to ask yourself here is, what does that person need to believe? So if you're being criticized by somebody else, what is it they need to believe? So belief, the idea that we believe in things, isn't always a want. It's not always about wanting to believe. Sometimes it's about needing to believe. So for example, I've worked in a lot of substance use treatment environments and mental health environments. And sometimes with substance use disorder, individuals who have the disorder don't want to admit that they have the disorder. So what they'll do is they'll criticize the counselors at the agency or the staff, and they'll say, you're a bad counselor, you don't know what you're doing, you don't know how to read the DSM. Now, clearly though, in many of those cases, there's a bias. Because for some of those people, they need to believe that they don't have a problem. Because if they have a problem, they would have to stop consuming substances and they don't want to do that. So it really gets into the area of denial, but I like to think of it also as bias. They need to believe it. So if you're being criticized by somebody, and as part of that criticism, they're really kind of supporting a belief that they need to believe. That's something we have to weigh in when we weigh the value and the nature of the criticism. The next letter is A, and this is for affect. So if somebody is criticizing you, and that criticism is emotionally charged, like yelling, screaming, over-talking you, that is something you have to consider when looking at the value of that criticism. Emotionally charged criticism usually isn't good criticism. Now, there's another side to this, though. Sometimes the affect can be compassion and empathy. So, again, it comes with the same difficulty, meaning when there's emotions involved, the level of criticism, the value, is usually going to be lower. But the source, compassion and empathy, overall I think would still be a better place than like a negative emotion, like anger or aggression. So we want to carefully evaluate the feelings. We want to look at the emotions involved on both sides and then use that to assess the nature of the criticism. The next letter in the acronym is S. This stands for source. You want to know the source of the criticism. Do you know the person? Are they knowledgeable in the area in which they're offering the criticism? Are they an expert? Is it their job to criticize you? Are they a consultant, a supervisor, a manager? Because that would make a big difference. If they had to criticize you as part of their job, that would, I think, make them a little more credible in terms of being a source. Another thing to ask yourself about the source is, do they criticize everyone? Are they the type of person who just criticizes everybody? That may lower the value of the criticism as well in terms of assessing it. It's important to remember when talking about the source that criticism can also be inaccurate. So somebody just may have no idea what they're talking about and they offer criticism. And of course, as flexible thinkers, we're taught to be open to criticism, but sometimes criticism is just plain wrong. It's technically incorrect and therefore it has no value or less value. The next letter in the acronym is I, and this is for intent. We want to look at the intent of the person who's criticizing you. Are they trying to hurt you? Are they trying to gain something, like maybe sell you something? One of my favorite examples of intent is like when people have a vehicle, like say a car, that they want to trade in, they want to buy another car. The salespeople always criticize the car that's being traded in, right? It always has problems. It's an older model. This vehicle is known to be defective. No one's going to want to buy this. But then they only talk about the good things about the car you want to buy, right? They don't really have criticism of that car. They only have positive things to say. This is the latest model. It's superior. It's worth all this extra money. So what you really see here is their intent is to sell you something. So their criticism, in this case, of your car would often be inaccurate. So in that situation, somebody might be inclined to think their car must be awful because they're not being offered much money in trade. But again, we have to look at the intent. Another portion of intent here we want to consider is, is the person a competitor? Are they competing for a job? Are they a business competitor? Are they competing for a love interest? 
If somebody called you unattractive, would you really take that seriously if you were competing with that person for the same love interest? Are they trying to impress someone? And something else to consider here with intent is, are they sadistic? Some people criticize other people because they're sadistic. I talked about this in a prior video about internet trolls, kind of a surprising finding in a study I was talking about. Now, on the other side of this, we have to think, in terms of intent, does the person want to help you? Maybe they want the best for you. Some people only criticize people that they want to help because everyone else is not worth their time. Criticizing is a lot of work and, in a sense, can have a lot of value. We would pay for criticism, even harsh criticism, from the right person who had the right intent. For example, going back to that car analogy, if you're looking to sell or trade your car, you would go to your mechanic and you would expect them to be critical of your car. You'd want them to use their expertise to give you an accurate criticism of that vehicle. Now, of course, it's different when it's about a person because we take it personally. But still, I think that analogy kind of holds up when talking about intent. Now, the last letter in this acronym is C, and it stands for concurrence. So when you hear criticism, a criticism is directed toward you. Is it echoed by legitimate sources that are not connected to one another? So are they independent sources? If it is, that may be something to consider. If a lot of people or a lot of different sources are telling you about the same attribute, they have the same criticism, that's a lot different than if just one person has the criticism. So that's what I call the basic model for coping with criticism. But what about separating criticism from insulting suggestions? So separating the destructive components away from the criticism. Well, what I've noticed is that people are generally really bad at this. We tend to focus on the insulting part. And this applies to a lot of the areas I talked about before with that basic model. For example, if somebody's insulting us, we tend to think they're biased. We tend to think they're emotionally charged. We tend to question them as a source. And we certainly question their intent. And because of that, we tend to discard all the criticism. So if somebody has an insult woven into their criticism, the whole criticism is out the window. So something important to consider here would be, is there really an insult in the criticism? Is there a destructive portion? Sometimes we see a destructive portion, we see the insult when it isn't there because we have our own bias. We filter information through our own perspective and therefore may see this insult when the insult actually isn't there. This is a characteristic of vulnerable narcissism. Somebody who has vulnerable narcissism tends to be hypersensitive to criticism. They tend to see threats in benign communication. But that, of course, doesn't mean that everybody is a vulnerable narcissist. It's just a characteristic of that type of narcissism. So if you discard just the insulting portion, if somebody does insult you, if it's really actually there, they're being destructive, and you can discard that, but focus on the legitimate criticism, but keep the part that may be helpful, that could, in fact, be useful. A lot of times, of course, though, as I mentioned, we throw the whole thing out, so we never really find out what happens. We never find out if that criticism has a good portion or not. So in considering all this information, all these thoughts, we want to really look at narcissism and consider whether that's useful, whether adopting characteristics of narcissism is really useful. And we want to understand the nature of the criticism and we want to separate the useful components of criticism from the potentially insulting components of criticism. So I know whenever I talk about narcissism and criticism and these different topics, there are going to be a variety of opinions. If you agree or disagree with me or have other opinions, please put those in the comments, even if those comments are critical. These comments and criticisms almost always result in a very interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found this description of unlocking your inner narcissist and coping with criticism to be interesting. Thanks for watching.